Okay, so today our passages, hopefully you would notice, have all been about light. And when we're talking about light, the thing that is always there first is the darkness. Now, I don't know about you, about whether or not when you were younger you were afraid of the dark. I know when I was a child, I could not go to sleep unless the hall light was on and my door was open a little bit. The idea of the pitch black scared me. Even when I was a young adult, I stayed at a friend's house um, in, uh, in Wales and I was house-sitting for them. It was this huge house. It was an Anglican minister and they, just, they have massive houses. And I used to do this, like, I had to turn off a light as I went, like, one by one. Like, turn off one light, go into the next room, turn the next light off. And, like, there was this one light where you switched it off at the kind of bottom of the stairs. And there was quite a, a, a passageway before you could get to the stairs to go upstairs. And I'd run. <laughs> and this is, like, in my 20s. But there was still that, that base pit fear of uncomfortableness, of, like, the darkness. I don't know. When I used to live in the building... And I'd come downstairs, and I'd walk through if I was doing washing, and the place would be dark, and this place creaks when there's no one in it, in a way that sounds like there's somebody upstairs. So all of us have this kind of this pit, this deep base fear. Within us. It's, it's, it's evolution. It makes sense, right? So sort of prehistoric man in the dark was when we were vulnerable, was when there were things that could catch us, when we were less able to, to, to protect ourselves. There's some psychologists as well that, um, that theorize that this fear of darkness was also to do with um, a sort of separation anxiety, that we feel separated and alone when we're in the dark. And I think this makes sense. And it kind of fits wonderfully, well, not wonderfully, but it fits well with this idea of being separated from God, like in the darkness. We are separated from him. And light, this idea of beauty and light has fascinated us for millennia. As soon as we were able to think about the fact that there is a difference between light and dark, it, has, it is within literature. It's, it's within the beginning of scripture, let there be light. It's gone through art, through Caravaggio and his beautiful paintings where he uses light to illuminate the, the, the focuses and the, the most important parts of his imagery. Much of his work being very dark around it and there being a real contrast. The idea of light is revelation. It reveals what's there. It shows us truth. It shows us what is around us. Because in the beginning... God created the heavens and earth. And it was a formless void. Darkness covered the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And I love this. And I don't think we should try and connect scripture to science. But I really love the idea that, did you know that when the Big Bang happened, the building blocks of the universe as we know it exploded and spread and started to form within seconds. And it wasn't until 380,000 years later that these little things called photons started to be released. And suddenly light streams across the galaxy. Or across the universe. And things like suns begin to form. And stars. And the who we are and that, that desire to, for light and for, for illumination is in us in that beginning. One of the things I'm going to be doing whilst I preach this morning is I'm going to do some artwork. Not many of you get to see much of my art, so I'm hoping you will enjoy this. I'm going to take it in turns. So I'm going to st- turn around and do some drawing, and you'll be able to see it. And then I'll turn back and start carry on with my message. The way I'm drawing this morning is a technique that I used when I was at university and college where you would cover the paper or your medium with charcoal and then scratch back into it and rub back into it with rubbers and with putty rubbers and all manner of implements. 
And so that's what I want us to do this morning. Just think about how that light grows and comes into the world piece by piece. this time of Advent is a time for looking forward and for looking back. So today we're going to start by looking back and thinking about the law and thinking about Isaiah and those passages in Genesis when God saw the light and he saw that it was good and he separates light from darkness. He called it the light day and the darkness night and there was evening and there was morning on the first day. And from this place of separation of the lightness and the dark, We see the law come into being through Moses and through the early church, the the early biblical um, patriarchs. For Judaism, the Torah, the law, these early books were life. They were light. They were what illuminated, God's illumination for the people. It was a, a guide on how to be and how to exist and how to work and to live with God. And then they get it wrong again and again. And they walk away from the light and they hide in the darkness. And we come to Isaiah, this prophet, a prophet speaking out in the darkness, calling the people back to the light. And we come to the servant song, this idea of an illumination of this this character that is going to bring Israel back home into the light, into the the warmth of God's glow. It says, now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. He says, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. And so we see this light that is coming is not only for Israel, it's not only for Jacob's people, it's for all the nations. And as those photons first whizzed out across the universe, bringing light into creation, Jesus comes to bring light to the world. This salvation is for all. This hope is for all. This light is for all.
And so now let's look forward to Advent, to this time of waiting, this Christmas time, this winter festival. It is no coincidence that we celebrate Christmas at this time of the year. This festival of light, of hope, of new life is older than this story of the baby. The fear of the darkness, of the longest night, of, of that, that, that primordial fear of will the sun come back again. December 25th is the winter solstice in the Roman calendar. The year is reborn again. It is also the festival of Saturnalia, where the masters would serve their servants and their slaves. There is this reversal of roles. And we think of the God Most High coming as this helpless little babe coming to serve, not to be served. And this time of year now has become a time of artificial light. There are some amazing sort of light decorations across London this year. If you go up Tottenham Court Road, there's this lovely giant bauble of light that you can kind of go and stand inside. And beautiful trees and the twinkling of windows as you walk home. There is still this desire to stave off the darkness within us. And into this time comes this message of hope, of truth. And I sometimes wonder if we're afraid of the dark, not simply because of the things unknown that might lurk there, but the things that we know lurk there too. The darkness within ourselves and the stuff that hides there. The parts of us that we don't show anyone. This is blues artist Robert Cray. He once sang, I know the difference between right and wrong, but it right and wrong, but it don't make no difference in the middle of the night. They did an experiment to show to find out if people behave differently in light and dark. And they they had dimly lit rooms and gave them challenges. And those that were in the dimly lit room cheated much more than those that were in the well lit room. And not only that, they did another experiment where they gave people sunglasses. So it was only the perception of darkness. And they cheated more than the people wearing clear glasses. Darkness covers our tracks. It makes us feel like we can't we don't we don't have to be identified, that we can be anonymous. And this sense of anonymity leads us to act in our own self-interest, dishonestly even. Scripture tells us that we love the darkness, that we don't want to leave it. Light has come into the world, but the people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I wonder how often we hide in our own darkness. We hide in the shadows.
And looking forward, we don't need to be afraid anymore. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light. In the new Jerusalem, in God's kingdom, that is all the light we need. God's illuminating presence. The two great lights of Genesis, the sun and the moon, become defunct and useless. The lamb becomes the lamp for the city, becomes the guiding light the one that guides our footsteps, teaches us the way. It says the nations will walk by her light. Again, we have this imagery that it is not just the chosen few, but all who will be led and illuminated by God's light, the light of the world, by this hope this new life shining in the darkness. Because the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And those that sat in the shadow of death, light has dawned. Because in the beginning was the word and it gave us the law which enlightened us. And it taught us. But now this light has come to be with us. To live amongst us. Showing through practical means the knowledge of God. What it is to follow him. What it is to be a disciple. What it is to have salvation. And it removes the darkness. It is the revelation of God's love, Christ's love for us. Because God sees the light and he sees that it is good. He sees us bathed in light and sees that we are good. O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come, thou day spring come, and cheer our spirits, thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. O come, O come, Emmanuel, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. God with us.
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It has not grasped it. It has not understood it. It doesn't comprehend, and it cannot master it. The light shines in our darkness, and our darkness will not overcome it either. Jesus calls us to walk whilst we have light, to not let our darkness overcome us. In a world of alienation, there was a man sent by God to pave the way for this lightness. To make smooth the rough places. To bring good news that the light to finally come into the world to save us. There was a man sent by God. I'm a woman sent by God. What person are you sent by God? Who are you sent to? Let us walk in the light that all might believe through us, that all might come to know the warmth of God's love and his glow. that all might see the light that has come into the world. Amen.